And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome everybody to Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virtual Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. It's great to be with you today, having a brand new week where we dive into uh, explaining, defending the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence. Yes, this is where the rubber of catechesis meets the road of everyday life. And uh, we're going to have a fantastic show because we're going to have a good friend, uh, Kenneth Hensley, come on. And Ken, as you know, we've been doing this really fascinating series uh, where Ken basically rehearses his own, um, I guess, uh, conversion to the Catholic faith as a Protestant pastor. He's going to seminary, and he begins to realize that this idea that we're made right by God by faith alone simply is not biblical. And uh, so today he's going to continue his series on that. Actually, uh, it's a fantastic series, folks, and I hope you've been enjoying it because uh, it really has given lots of really neat insights into, uh, y- you know, um, how unbiblical this idea truly is. And uh, and Ken has a very unique approach to it. And like I said, it was instrumental in him becoming Catholic. So that alone uh you know it's worthy of interest so he'll be coming up on the other side of the break on this side of the break as always we're going to do our finding the fallacy which today is the inflation of conflict fallacy and also we're going to meet an early church father today's early church father is actually um very very early he has an apostolic father and his name happens to be hermas so we're going to look at hermas and his work the shepherd Lots of great stuff in store for us today. So uh, as we begin our program, I want to welcome all of you watching live stream on Facebook and all the other platforms we live stream on. Hi, everybody. Also, I want to welcome all of you listening on radio around the country and also via podcast around the world, either through our handy dandy phone app or through our flagship website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org. And uh, that is a fantastic place to go to. Like I said, it's a great website to have bookmark. (coughs) You know, one of these days I'd love to do a show just on web resources for apologetics. That would be a lot of fun. You know, just uh, if you're defending the faith, explaining the faith, maybe you're learning more and more about the faith. Because I know apologetics is one of those vehicles where many Catholics uh, continue their adult catechesis in the faith. Um, there's so many great webs, uh, websites out there that have information for free. You know, I remember way back when I first started apologetics in the early nineties, um, there was nothing, <laughs> even in terms of books, uh, the, the, the Catholic press had, uh, pretty much stopped publishing some good, uh, Orthodox material in English. There were still some good publishers out there that were cranking out titles like Ignatius press, uh, servant books was very good, things like that. But by and large, it, it was hard to do research. It was hard to get solid information. You had to pick on a, a lot of Catholic classics. That's why we do this thing with Carl Keating every month. Cause we highlight these awesome books that were written around the turn of the century. They still are valuable today. Um, but anyway, you know, things have changed an awful lot over the last few decades. And now there are just these tremendous online resources where you can get information almost instantaneously, where you would spend hours in a seminary library looking up some of the stuff. And uh, also, it's free. It's not only very convenient, but it's free. So, you know, maybe I'll do that. I'll have to make a note. Uh, we'll have to do a show on web resources. I'll take you to all my favorite websites. Uh, that's good, solid Catholic material that I visit almost every day. But anyway, uh, the reason I bring that up is virtualmostpowerfulradio.org. It should be on your bookmark simply because, well, you have access to all the shows, you know, all the hands-on apologetic shows that you can share with your friends. Uh, and that in itself is a very valuable resource. 
Um, also, Virgin Most Powerful also puts on some great conferences, and I just want to plug this one conference that's coming up very soon. Just around the corner, man, July is flying. It's the Sex and Honor Conference. It has uh, Dr. Louise Sandoval, also Sherry uh, Bellinger, and Mary Danelle Barber. That's going to be coming up on August 7, 2021. And if you can, you definitely want to show up at Sacred Heart Chapel, which is right next door to the Virgin Most Powerful Radio World Command Center. And uh, it's going to be a fantastic conference. And also there's a live stream option. Now, I'm not going to give you all the deets. You can do that yourself by just jumping online. Go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, check it out for yourself. Just uh, great stuff. And, and as you know, you know, it's one of those battlegrounds, especially if you're a parent, on, uh, you know, on sexuality questions, things like this. This is something that you need to be armed. Even if you're not a parent, maybe you're uh, younger, you're not married, you should still have this under your belt because uh, you eventually may need it. And also you can help your friends who might have questions about that. So you could share that or just share the information from the conference itself. All right. So um, let's see. Let's go to the Finding the Fallacy, shall we? Uh, the Finding the Fallacy today is called the Inflation of Conflict Fallacy. And it's basically reasoning that because authorities cannot agree precisely on an issue, no conclusions can be reached at all, and minimizing the credibility of authorities as a result. This is a kind of form of black and white thinking. Either uh, they know the exact truth or they know nothing at all. Um, <clears throat> now, the funny thing is uh, that definition actually comes from uh, an atheist website. It's a good definition, too, but usually they, they are thinking of the inflation of conflict fallacy as a, being applied to Christians that may dismiss science because certain scientists may have slightly different uh, ideas about certain things in science that uh, may compete with a, a Christian worldview. And so there's this fallacy where then they'll say, well, then scientific research knows nothing about that particular area, which isn't true, right? But on the other hand, this is also one that's used an awful lot by atheists. It's also used by Protestants and others. Uh, let me give you a good example from Protestantism. I'm working on my new manuscript that's uh, uh, it's not completed, but I'm doing some work on sacred tradition. And I'm addressing right now this issue of the early church fathers. And Protestants will use this inflation of conflict fallacy to dismiss the value of the witness of the early church fathers by saying, well, the early church fathers didn't agree precisely on a particular issue. Therefore, we can just dismiss everything they've said. And, of course, that's wrong, right? Because although, let's, let's take the doctrine of the Trinity, they might not have been able to formulate with uh, technical jargon the exact and precise nature of the Trinity. Nevertheless, they still are very valuable witnesses for the Trinity, even if uh, perhaps they were imprecise. And so if you ever run across this, just realize that the person's engaging in the inflation of conflict fallacy. And just point that out, that simply because, uh, you know, certain authorities may not be in perfect agreement with each other, nevertheless, they do more or less coincide in a particular position. And that does have some weight. All right. So that's our finding of the fallacy for today, the inflation of conflict fallacy. Let's move to meet our early church father for today, who is Hermas. Uh, the Muratorian Fragment is responsible for the information uh, that Hermas was the author of The Shepherd. Uh, he was the brother of Pope St. Pius I, who reigned between 140 and 155 AD. Uh, from The Shepherd itself, a few other items of curious information reveal themselves about Hermas, for example. He was a slave and afterwards a free man. He had a farm on a highway between uh, Rome and Cume, and, uh, but he lost it in business reverses. His children apostatized from the faith and betrayed him in the persecutions. His wife had an unbridled tongue and was generally shrewish. Uh, in fact, he, uh, we know quite a few details, delightful details about him, says Jurgen's faith early fathers. 
But in the dry category of what would often pass as useful information, we are, in Hermes's case, quite at a loss, which perhaps is no great loss at all, says Jurgen's faith at early fathers. Uh, we only have one extent writing from Hermes, and that is, as I said, the shepherd, or sometimes called the pastor of Hermes. Uh, pa- by the way, pastor is Latin for shepherd. Uh, the shepherd is a rather lengthy work belonging in the category of apocryphal apocalypses. The work consists of three major st- sections, the first division into five chapters called visions, the second into 12 chapters called mandates, and the third in 10 chapters called parables. The work is important for its ethical concepts and for its bearing on the sacrament of penance. Accepting the statement of anonymous author of the Muratorian Fragment that the work was written at Rome by Hermas while his brother Pius was bishop, uh, which itself uh, actually presents a problem. Uh, and like I said, Pius reigned from 140 to 155 A.D., uh, this would imply that uh, the the problem is that within the Shepherd of Hermes, he also mentions a contemporary named Clement. And if this refers to Clement of Rome, we have a problem because Clement lived much earlier than the time of Pius, obviously, because he was an earlier pope. Uh, but Jurgen says the difficulty is usually obviated by stating hypothetically that Hermes wrote some part of the work much earlier, bringing it to completion during his brother's pontificate. Even if we accept the usual late date of Clement's reign, uh, this gives us a span of 40 to 60 years for the writing of the work. And so that would place him firmly within the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. Ah, you hear the music coming up. And that means we are going on break. Coming up next, we're going to talk with Ken Hensley about solo feet. Stay tuned. Now, back to Hands on Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. Apologetics. We're going to talk about sola fide, which is Latin for faith alone. And, uh, you know, this is the idea that we are made right by God by uh, simply by our faith and that anything that's added to that is nothing other than a damning system of works righteousness. Well, is that true? Is it biblical? Well, to help us answer that question, we have our good friend Ken Hensley. As you know, Ken has been delivering a fantastic series on this very topic. And uh, Ken, welcome to Hands On Apologetics. Yeah, it's good to see you again, Gary. It's great to see you. So how has life been treating you there in sunny California? Just, yeah, I'm just doing well, doing fine. Yeah. I have nothing to complain about right now. <laughs> That's good. You know, I have a question for you. When you go on vacation, where do you go? I mean, California is like the perfect place. Uh, sunny, oh, you got well. water. Where else could you go? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, California is also the place that burns down every year. So there, <laughs> That's there are some negative a- a- aspects. <laughs> but um, I don't know. Uh, you know, just different things. I mean, we, um, you know, often... Since we have so many grandkids now, you know, I have nine grandchildren and they live five minutes away from us. We end up doing a lot of things, just short things over the weekend and uh, taking the kids with us or one kid or two or three or four or five or something like that. So um, you just go other places for vacation. All, although, yeah, you can go up to Yosemite here. You can go up the beautiful Highway 1 up to Big Sur. There are a lot of great things to see here in California. Yeah, no, that's cool. Wow, nine grandchildren. That's awesome. I'm sure that yeah. keeps you busy. Yeah, I mean, especially the living five minutes away from us part. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm quite involved with them. Yeah, that's I mean, awesome. I, I think I've probably told you before. I my daydream w- that was was that at this time of life I'd be spending hours and hours and hours sitting in chairs reading books, and instead I'm I'm all over the place. Like we have a birthday party here today at two uh, two p.m. So nice. Yeah, good, very good. Okay. Well, it keeps you hopping. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, well. You know, uh, I've been really enjoying our series on Sol Fide because, uh, like I said, I've been taking notes throughout this, just really great insights. And uh, especially since uh, this is tied to your own journey of faith. So maybe mm-hmm. we could just start with a, a minute or two, just kind of bring us up to speed. 
Oh, on what we've been doing? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, doing a series with you one time per month, I know that it, it can <laughs> seem pretty stretched out and elongated. And I, I, I can even forget where we're at until I go and read the articles that I've written on this. Um, and the show that I do with Matt Swaim at the Coming Home Network called On the Journey with Matt and Ken, we worked through this issue uh, months months and months ago. And so I'm, I'm kind of rehearsing the material with you. But, um, okay, I'll start by stating what we're going to focus on now. And I look at uh, – there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of content and my tendency might be just just to start talking a thousand miles an hour and try to cram it all in. I, I, I'm gonna please help me to not do that, okay? I want to slow down. I'd rather be accurate. I'd rather make sure that we actually teach something, something's communicated, even if we don't make it all the way through, okay? But w where we are in our series, I'll start there and then work backward. Um, is the question of what in the world does Saint Paul mean when he says repeatedly that we are saved by faith and not works, not by works of the law. What does Paul mean? I mean, especially given the fact that for several weeks now, you and I have been talking about the fact that in Scripture, both faith and obedience to God are presented constantly as both, I mean, as both being required for those who would make their way toward eternal life. I mean, it's always faith and obedience. Noah had to trust God and build the ark. Abraham had to trust God and leave Ur of the Chaldees and follow the Lord. Um, Naaman the Syrian had to trust what the Lord said to him and go and wash in the Jordan River. Jesus says to the man born blind, go and wash in the pool of Siloam and you'll come up seeing. He had to trust Jesus and he had to go do it. Even on the day of Pentecost when Peter stands up to preach and the crowds are cut to the heart and they say, what must we do? He says, repent and be baptized, you know. It, you know, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The message, we've been seeing this, the message all the way through the Bible is trust God and do what God tells you to do and you will receive the blessing. Faith and obedience are both presented as conditions for receiving God's promised blessings, always, okay? But, but if this is the case, then uh, here's the problem that arises. If this is the case, then what in the heck does Paul mean when he says we are saved by faith, not by works? or not by works of the law? Um, that's the question, okay? Now, L Luther, at the time of the Reformation, Luther's doctrine of justification, that is the doctrine that became the Reformation doctrine that uh, that Protestants hold to this day, it, it grew out of his own personal struggle. Luther knew that God was righteous. N Luther knew that he was a sinner and he was unrighteous, and struggling to become righteous uh, led to continual misery and exhaustion in his life. So it's Luther, as he's lecturing through the books of Galatians and Romans and the Psalms, um, when Luther read where Paul said in Romans 1 16, that, it, that the gospel, that in the gospel, or, or that the gospel is, quote, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then when Luther read what Paul said in 328, for we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, um, Luther, this is my view, Luther interpreted Paul through the lens of his own struggle, his own personal struggle to try to be righteous in order to make the righteous God satisfied with him. And he interpreted Paul's words through this lens, and he took Paul to be saying that we are justified by faith alone, apart from the need to do anything, okay, a apart from the need to be obedient to God. And this is why Luther said that, that, that when this revelation came to him, it was, it was like the light had been turned on and he walked through open doors into paradise because here he had been struggling to be obedient to God, struggling to make himself righteous and failing and dealing with this continual misery. And now he understands that what Paul is saying is that in Christ, we are justified in the sight of God Merely by believing, the moment we look to Christ in faith, we are justified, and we don't have to do anything, okay? And so this is the doctrine that has come down, has been held ever since, especially by those of the, for, uh, the more Reformed traditions of Protestantism. They would say that when it comes to how we are justified in the sight of God, faith and obedience are viewed in opposition to one another. It's either faith alone or you're trying to be justified by works. It's either faith or obedience. It's faith 
or works. Okay, get that? It, 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 they're put in complete opposition to one another. And any attempt to mix the two at all, to say, well, we need to trust Christ and we need to do it, you know, at least be baptized. I mean, anything is to destroy the gospel in their minds. And uh, here's a quotation from Reformed Pastor John MacArthur. He says, those who trust Jesus Christ for justification by faith alone receive a perfect righteousness that is credited, reckoned to them. Those who attempt to establish their own righteousness or mix faith with works only receive the terrible wage that is due all who fall short of perfection. Okay, that's why it's a damning system of works righteousness. Either it's faith alone, Gary, I mean, either we look to Christ and we're justified by faith alone, or in some manner, we're thinking that we will be justified by doing something. And in that case, well, we better do perfectly then. We better do absolutely perfectly if we want to be saved in that way. Okay, and that's why he says that the terrible wage is what lies ahead for all, that that is due all who fall short of perfection. Hmm. Okay, so last week, or last month, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> you and I spent time looking at the preaching of Isaiah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, and Jesus, okay? Because I was trying to make the point that when I look back through the Bible then, and I ask myself, do I see the authors of Scripture pitting faith against obedience? That is, pitting faith in God against obedience to God? The answer is no. Um, in the preaching of the prophets all the way through, faith in God and obedience to God are continue to be viewed as flip sides of the same coin. They're never set in opposition to one another. In fact, there is never a contrast drawn between faith in God and obedience to God. You know, humble faith in God and humble, sincere obedience to God. Never is there a contrast drawn between the two. Rather, in the preaching of the prophets, to the Jews of their time, especially to the Jewish leadership, the contrast that we find drawn in Scripture is always a contrast between those who trust God and do what he says, <laughs> faith and obedience, and those who are trusting in their status as God's chosen people. Those who are trusting in their identity as the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those who are boasting in the visible badges of that identity, that is especially Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath, keeping the dietary laws, um, circumcision, temple worship, and all that. Maybe you remember some of the passages from last month from Isaiah where he says, I'm sick of your incense, your sacrifices, they're a burden to me, I don't want to hear them anymore. Uh, many passages like that. Jeremiah is saying, uh, you know, blasting those who are circumcised and yet are uncircumcised in their hearts. And, and, and the call that the prophets make to them is never stop trying to be obedient to God and start uh, expressing faith alone. If it's always, you need to trust God and do what God says. Stop relying on your status as Jews. That's basically the message that we find. And we saw this epitomized, really, in the message of John the Baptist when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to him at the Jordan River, and he says to them, you brood of vipers who, fl who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit that befits repentance. And, and here's the key. And Quit, here's my paraphrase, stop saying we have Abraham for our father, you know, right. okay? Yeah. You, you get the feeling of that. Stop, please. You know, he's like, I'm sick of hearing you say we are Jews. We have Abraham for our father. He says, you know, God can take these stones and he can make children for Abraham if he wants. Instead, the ax is laid at the root of the trees, every tree that does not bear good fruit. So, see, this epitomizes, John the Baptist is saying, you need to trust in God and bear good fruit. You need to trust God and obey him. Please, please stop thinking that because you keep the Sabbath perfectly and you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and you're, and you're circumcised and you are the direct descendants of Abraham, that you've got it made with God. You don't, okay? So what I'm saying here then is that in contrast to Luther's interpretation of Paul, what I came to believe, you mentioned my own story, yeah, as part of my own conversion, what I came to believe over time was that when Paul sets faith in opposition to works, when he says we're justified by faith, not by works, not by works of the law, Paul isn't contrasting faith in God with obedience to God. He isn't saying we're justified by faith alone apart from the need to be obedient to God. We don't need to do anything. We don't need to be obedient, faith alone. Instead, 
and this is what I'm going to argue as we get back after the after the the music starts any second. Within the historical context that Paul's operating, within the theological context at the time, I believe that what Paul was saying in his own way is essentially the same thing that Isaiah was saying, and Jeremiah was saying, and John the Baptist, and Jesus, when Jesus said the same sorts of things, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and you have neglected the weightier matters, justice, love, whatnot. Hey, I've got my timing down with you, man. Yeah, that, that was perfect. All right, we're chatting with Ken Ensley, talking about Sola Fide. More to come on the other side of the break. You're listening to Hands On Apologetics. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. Hands on apologetics. We were chatting with Ken Hensley about mm-hmm. Sol Fide. And uh, yeah, that was a great wrap up, Ken, because uh, it really does come down to misunderstanding the, the problem that Jesus and Paul are addressing, namely this this idea that uh, uh, because I'm part of God's covenant people, you know, I'm a circumcised uh, son of Abraham, I, I keep the, uh, you know, uh, tithing laws, the dietary laws, then then I'm okay regardless of whether or not I commit adultery or I steal. Or, you know, that's really what they're focusing on. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's really a matter, and this is the case when doing biblical studies, though, is that if you don't really, if you don't really understand the question being asked and the situation in which the person is writing, then it's easy just to read it uh, through the lens of your own experience and think, oh, this is what he's talking about, you know? Yeah. So anyway, okay, I've made this claim then at this point uh, about what Paul is dealing with in those pa- in those classic passages where he says, not by not by works not by works of the law, but by faith. But but now it remains to be shown, okay? And so I want to go into the weeds here, and there's a little bit of, um, you know, uh, by, uh, some Bible teaching, okay? And, uh, you know, to kind of walk through this, because I want to try and substantiate what I'm saying here and fill this picture out um, as, as to what Paul was dealing with. So first of all, let's think about the historical situation in which Paul's writing. Okay, now you remember, let's go back in the book of Acts to chapter 10, you remember when Peter was first received this vision, the sheet that came down from heaven and this vision, um, instructing Peter to go to the house of Cornelius and preach the gospel to Gentiles. This was the beginning. The, this was the first. It's recorded in Acts chapter 10. It was a struggle for Peter. In fact, upon entering the house of Cornelius, nearly the first thing Peter says to uh, Cornelius was, you you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. That's Acts 10, verse 28. So think about it. As, as a Jew, Gentiles were considered to be unclean. Jews had nothing to do with them. In fact, Peter is basically saying that he has never in his life entered the home of, of a Gentile until this moment. And yet God has sent him there, and so here he is in obedience to the vision, and he's entering the house. He's never eaten with a Gentile. He's never even been in the home of a Gentile. Okay, because of this, even after he's preaching, you remember the Holy Spirit falls upon Cornelius and his household, and Peter realizes, hey, what's to stop these people from being baptized? They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Okay, so even after this happens, when Peter travels back to Jerusalem, we read in Acts chapter 11, verse 3, that, quote, the circumcision party criticized him. The circumcision party criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Okay, so th- there's this group, and they're, they're a group of believers. These are believers in Christ who meet with Peter, and yet he refers to them as the circumcision group, and they complain, why did you go into the house of Gentiles and eat with them? Peter explains to them what happened. In fact, he goes back in detail. He talks about the vision he received from God and what happened. And when he, after he explains it, they are silenced, and the text says that they glorified God. In chapter 11 of Acts, uh, verse 8, they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles God has granted repentance unto life. In other words, wow. I mean, as shocking as this is, I guess we, we have to accept the fact that God has, has allowed the gospel to go to Gentiles. Okay, But the problem didn't go away, because in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, we read, But some men came down to Antioch from Judea and were teaching the brethren 
unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay. In fact, this is what uh, um, this is what gave occasion to the very first council of Christian history. We refer to as the Council of Jerusalem that was held in Acts chapter 15. So reading on in Acts chapter 15, verse 5, we learn a little bit more about this group that are causing trouble in Antioch. Um, Quote, but some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to charge them to keep the law of Moses. So this is at the council. They, they meet in Jerusalem now. This is Peter. This is the other apostles. These are the elders in the church and whoever else was there to discuss this issue. And these these who belong to the party of the Pharisees, and yet they're believers, some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees. So, so get the picture. Within early Christianity, there are some who were former Pharisees, Jewish converts from the Pharisees, who have this idea that, look, okay, the gospel has gone to Gentiles, that's fine. We understand, Peter, that God instructed you to do it, but listen, in order for them to be saved, though, they need to be circumcised, and they need to live according to the customs of Moses. In short, they need to be like Jewish proselytes. They need to become Jews to be saved. Mm -hmm. This is what the council meets to discuss, and of course, they decide that there's no, they don't have to. Okay, that's the that's the upshot of the council. Okay, but but here's here's my point, Gary. This is the background. This is what's going on in Paul's ministry, and this is what Paul is dealing with throughout his ministry. So the thing I want to make clear here is this: Paul is not dealing with former Pharisees who have been converted to Christ. He's not dealing with former Pharisees who are saying, "Hey, listen, in order for Gentiles to be saved." They need to trust God and obey Him. You know, he's not right. dealing with yeah. he's not dealing with Christians who are saying, "Look, it's not good enough just to uh, to uh, to trust God. They need to trust God and do what God says." There needs to be sincere faith and sincere obedience to Christ in order to be saved. That that's not what he's dealing with. What he's dealing with is people who are saying that in order to be saved, Gentiles need to become Jews. They need to receive circumcision. And they need to begin to live by the Mosaic Code, Sabbath, food laws, keeping all the okay, the Mosaic Law, fine, and w- which 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 includes moral stipulations. But but the but the tenor of it is, is they need to become Jews. They need to become Jewish proselytes and live according to the to the customs of Moses. That's the phrase that's used. This is what Paul's dealing with, and therefore here's my argument: when Paul, in response to this, says that a man is justified by faith quote, apart from works of the law, unquote. This is what he has in mind. He isn't separating faith in Christ from obedience to Christ. He's saying, this is what you don't have to do. You don't have to become Jews. And I think this is what we can see in Paul's letters, even in Galatians and Romans and Philippians, the three letters that um, Protestants typically point to as teaching most clearly justification by faith alone. I think we can see this in the letters themselves. Um, so uh, any comment from you? Absolutely. And, yeah, and, and it's interesting uh, that after the council in Acts 15 that uh, the council fathers uh, leave it to Barnabas and Paul to imp- to implement this, you know, amongst the Gentiles. So really his mission is to go out and, you know, stop these uh, Pharisaic believers from disturbing the Gentiles. So right. yeah, that fits perfectly with his letters. Okay, now, so then taking this as the historical background, what he's dealing with, then let's take them in order, Galatians, Romans, and and Philippians, but Galatians is almost the primary one. We'll start there, okay? Okay, you open up Paul's letter to the Galatians, and he begins by saying, I am astonished that you so quickly are deserting him who has called you in the grace of Christ, turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some of you, there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, if that's all we had was just that, and, and I were to say, who do you think these people are that are troubling these Gentile believers in Galatia, uh, troubling them and wanting to pervert? You would immediately go back to Acts 10 and 11 and 15, and you'd say, it's those guys. Mm-hmm. It's those guys from the circumcision party, okay? They're the ones that are troubling. And the thing is, when we look through Galatians, we find, ah, it, yeah, it sounds like it's the same people. Check, check this out. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, 
Paul mentions these that are coming in and troubling, mentions them as those who have, quote, slipped in to spy out our freedom, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into bondage. Okay, there's a little description of them. In the same context, he mentions that this group were apparently demanding that Titus be circumcised, and Paul refused. Oh, okay, so they want to Okay, they want to slip in, they want to spy out their freedom, they want to bring them into bondage. Ah, they're demanding that Titus, at least, Gentile convert, be circumcised. In verse 12 of that chapter, Paul identifies these people as being of, quote, the circumcision party, unquote. There's that phrase again from Acts chapter 11 and the people of Acts 15. Paul describes how when some of them came from James, so from Jerusalem, where the Pharisees were, the converts, the Jewish converts, the Pharisees, the circumcision party were mainly located in Jerusalem. He says that when some of them came, Peter, fearing them, separated himself from the Gentile believers and would not eat with them. Oh, there's the dietary restrictions coming in. And Peter becoming intimidated by them and separating himself from the Gentiles, not wanting to eat with them. When you put this all together, I mean, I don't think it takes, you know, they say it's not rocket science. It doesn't take a brain surgeon. As they say, it appears that what Paul was dealing with in Galatia is essentially the same thing that he and Barnabas and Peter and the others were dealing with in Acts 15. Jewish converts, probably from the party of the Pharisees, the circumcision party, had apparently come to Galatia, troubling the Gentile converts there that Paul had won, insisting that they be circumcised and begin to live by the laws of Moses in order to be saved. And therefore, when Paul responds to them in that classic passage in Acts, I mean, in, in Galatians 2, verse 16, and Paul says, we know that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. This is what I believe he has in mind. Again, he's not saying anything like, look, you need to be justified by faith alone, you don't have to do anything. We don't need to be, you don't need to become obedient to Christ in order to be saved. He's not talking about that at all. He's talking about the same thing that we saw in Acts 10 and 11 and 15. That's the background. And I think it can be seen from the text too, um, because if, 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 if this is what I did, if you ask yourself the question, okay, Paul's saying not by works of the law. What does Paul mean by works of the law? Are there any indications in the book of Galatians itself? I mean, are there any indications of what he means by this phrase, works of the law? Um, it isn't hard to find, because if you read through the book of Galatians, Gary, you find him talking about circumcision constantly. I mean, five, six, seven times. You find him talking about Jews not sharing table fellowship with Gentiles, the, the Peter episode. You find him talking about Jewish festivals and feasts. In fact, he says, you observe days and months and seasons. I'm afraid that I've labored over you in vain. We'll be back. Yeah, very good. We're chatting with Ken Ensley about Soul Free Day. More to come on the other side of the break. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. We are talking with Ken Hensley of uh, Coming Home Network. Also, he's with the uh, Matt and Ken show, and we're talking about works of law. And specifically, Ken gave a great explanation of how in Galatians, Paul's talking about the, the works of law being those things that make a Jew a Jew as far as outward signs. And, uh, yeah, Ken, great point at the end. You know, Paul doesn't say, uh, who has bewitched you, that you're now observing days, months, seasons, and years. He doesn't say, who has bewitched you, you're observing uh, good works and fasting and prayer and helping little old ladies across the street. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's a, you, that, you yeah, forsaken that's a, the gospel. <laughs> that, that's a good way to put it, yes. He doesn't say, oh, you, you've turned the gospel on its head. Who has bewitched you? You you believe now that you need to love God and love your neighbors yourself? You know, don't you realize we're not justified by obedience to God like that? You know, yeah. no, it's by faith alone. Instead, if you read just read through Galatians asking yourself the question, what are the what are the, what does he have in his mind? What are these things that these people are teaching them that are bad? You find him talking about circ circumcision again and again. You find him talking about the table fellowship issue. I mean, why else did he bring out that illustration of him and Peter and the conflict they got in over what Peter had done there? Yeah. Um, you find him talking about the festivals. He says, you observe days, months, and seasons. 
and years I'm afraid I've labored over you in vain. In another passage, in fact, he says he wishes that those who were troubling them would slip with the knife and mutilate themselves. Yeah. So it's total. So it's totally clear. Oh, I don't see you anymore, Gary. I see someone else now. Oh. Okay. Um, it's totally clear what he has in his mind. You know, he didn't say to them, you know, you know, I, I wish these people who are saying to you that you have to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, I wish they would just shut up. Instead, he says, I wish these people who are troubling you would take that knife that they love so much, the circumcision knife, and they would just slip and castrate themselves. <laughs> it's clear what he has in his mind. Okay, yeah. Paul isn't contrasting faith in Christ with obedience to Christ. In fact, he nearly concludes his letter by saying this. Do not be deceived. This is in chapter 6. This is near the end. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. He who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So he's saying, look, in, in conclusion, let me warn you. You know, God is going to, uh, whatever a man sows, that he will reap. I want you to sow to the Spirit in your life so that you will reap the harvest of eternal life. And then he says this. If the question was coming up, well, what do you mean by so to the Spirit? What does that mean? Let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. It clearly is not contrasting faith and obedience. Clearly. Mm-hmm. Okay, now let's hit Romans quickly, and then I want to go back to Galatians. Um, we'll, we'll do Philippians next time. Okay. 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 In Romans, I think we find the same thing as we found in Galatians. I mean, in chapter 1 of Romans, Paul establishes that Gentiles need salvation. The Gentiles need salvation. In Romans chapter 2, he establishes that the Jews need salvation as well. And the way that he addresses his Jewish readers, I think it it, uh, makes it clear that he's anticipating from the Jewish readers the same attitude that Isaiah and Jeremiah and John the Baptist and Jesus confronted, the attitude that says, but we have Abraham for our father, you know. Don't, you know, don't put us in the same basket with the Gentiles. We have Abraham. The, I say this because just notice a few things. Why else would, I mean, the, this would explain why Paul launches out in the way he does in Romans chapter 2 to the Jews, saying, but if you call yourself a Jew and you rely on the law and you boast in your relationship with God, okay, this explains why he would say in chapter 2, verse 25, circumcision indeed has value if you obey the law. Or again in 2.28, where Paul says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision something external and physical. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. Okay, so what I'm saying is in the very way that he addresses the Jews, it seems apparent that he's expecting that same kind of comeback from them, you know? And so he's focusing on the fact that, look, don't come saying to me, well, you know, well, we received the law, we received the covenants, we have circumcision. Don't come to me boasting in this stuff, because it's not a matter of being, I mean, circumcision only has value if you really, from your heart, are obeying God. You know, um, a true Jew is one who is one circumcised inwardly. Okay, this would also explain why in chapter 4 of, of um, Romans, Gary, Paul goes off on this long tangent in which he makes this elaborate argument about how Abraham was declared righteous before he received circumcision, okay? You know, why would he need to make that argument? Except that the people he's writing to, he anticipates that they're thinking that circumcision is what will do the job, you know? And he's saying, hey, look, remember, Abraham was declared righteous in God's sight when? Ah, before he was even circumcised, okay? So Paul knows that many of his Jewish readers believe that they have it made with God because they are Jews. And just as in Galatia, Paul is intent upon making them understand that this isn't what matters to God. And now here's the classic thing, and I'm going to throw it to you. Romans 3.28 is the classic passage then. Paul has shown that Gentiles need God. The Jews need God, chapter 2. He's in chapter 3, which he summed it up. Everyone needs God, Gentiles and Jews both. And then he makes that classic statement, for we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And here's the question that I want to ask you. There's a question I would ask any um, Protestant who's listening to this. 
if what Paul means by works of the law here is what Luther took him to mean, that is obedience to Christ, if what Paul is saying here is, for we hold that a man is justified by faith alone apart from obedience to Christ, if that's what Paul is saying, why does he immediately ask the rhetorical question in verse 29, or is God the God of Jews only? Okay, now, this may be a little too complicated, but it's an but this is a mic drop yeah, it's moment, a, very okay? important, yeah, absolutely. This is a mic drop. If what he meant in 328 by faith, not by works of the law, if what he meant was what Luther took him to mean and what Protestants take him to mean, justified by faith alone, apart from the need to be obedient, apart from obedience, why does he immediately say, or is God the God of Jews only? It's obvious that when Paul uses that phrase, works of the law, what he has in mind is stuff relating to Jewishness. Yep. He, he, he definitely has in his mind the things that pertain to Jewishness. That is, the badges of identity that the Jews wore that separated them from the Gentiles. That's what he means by works of the law. I don't believe that Paul is saying what Luther and Protestantism since have understood him to be saying— this is why Paul can reject the works of the law and then turn right around and say in Romans 2, 6, God will render to every man according to his deeds. Sounds like Galatians 6, right? right? To those who by patience and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Okay, now I want to hit on something quickly, Gary, before we run out of time. Okay, because there are three little passages in Paul that I think vir virtually amount to a proof, <laughs> okay? Yeah. If there could be... Um, that the interpretation that we're giving here of Paul is the correct interpretation, okay? That is, three times in Paul, Paul states flat out exactly what doesn't count with God and what does count with God. I mean, he just says, okay, let me get to the bottom line. This is what doesn't count with God. This is what does count. And listen to them. First is Galatians 5, 6, where Paul says, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love. Okay, the first time, which fits with everything we said about Galatians, first time he says, now look, whether you are circumcised or uncircumcised, that is not what matters with, to God, which shows us what the circumcision party was arguing for. Hmm. What matters is having a faith that works itself out through love, a faith that works through love. Second, Galatians 6.15, where Paul says, neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation Okay, here Paul says, same book, whether you're circumcised, whether you're uncircumcised, that's not what matters to God. That's not what counts. What matters is that you be a new creation in Christ. So add them up. What matters is faith working through love. What matters is, is that you are a new creation in Christ. And then here's the third one. And this is the one that was like a bomb falling on my head at the time when I began to understand it. It's in 1 Corinthians seven nineteen. This one hit me like a, a brick in the forehead. Listen to what Paul says. Neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Okay. Here he says, it isn't a matter of whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. What counts with God is that you keep his commandments. I mean, in other words, in this passage, Paul is actually setting circumcision over against keeping the commandments of God. Hmm. He's not setting circumcision or, I mean, he's not setting faith over against obedience. I mean, do, do you catch the, uh, the oh, yeah. power of this? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, so it, it's not um, it's not as if works of the law are good works, because that would make Paul contradict himself, right? When he says, yes. uh, you know, it's not circumcision, but keeping the commandments. It's rather, uh, it's yeah, it's exactly what you laid out. That works of the law are those is circumcision, dietary regulations, all those things that distinguish Jews from Gentiles. Yeah, and I think that this passage is pretty much kind of nails, uh, puts the nail in the coffin on this idea that what Paul is saying is we're justified by faith apart from obedience. Yeah. I mean, because here he says, it's not circumcision, rather it is keeping the commandments of God. So add them up. So what does count with God then is having a faith that works itself out in love, being a new creation in Christ, and keeping the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. That's the positive side. 
The negative side, what doesn't matter to God is whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, which again shows us what the background is that Paul's dealing with, that this comes up again and again and again and again. Yeah, I guess let, let me, I guess, close by you're always asking me to say something about what I do, and it's always the last 10 seconds. So, um, <laughs> okay, go right ahead. I'm with the Coming Home Network. You know, we, we work to help Protestants and Protestant ministers, um, Protestant clergy who are looking at the Catholic faith to come home to the Catholic Church by holding up the truth and beauty of the Catholic faith. Um, so, I deal with Protestant pastors mainly, uh, constantly, of all denominations scattered all around the world. And then I do a show with Matt Swaim, our, our so, social media manager at Coming Home Network, that's called On the Journey with Matt and Ken. It's a YouTube show um, where we are explaining, as I am here, explaining the reasons that we had for becoming Catholic. And then one more thing, if anybody, um, I've done a lot of recorded lectures in the past, and if anybody wants to purchase MP3 downloads of those, you can go to kennethhensley.com. kennethhensley.com, go to the store page, and uh, very inexpensively load down those. Hey, I did it. Awesome. Hey, beautiful. And a great, great lesson for today, too. Ken, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Appreciate it. We'll see All you next right. month. Absolutely. That's Ken Hensley, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, check it out. KennethHensley.com. It's got great stuff. Also, the Coming Home Network. Just a, a treasure trove. Well, it's already time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center here. Turn off the Dojo lights. Thank you so much for listening. And coming up next, the Terry and Jesse Show. Stay tuned.